So in chapter 12, we're looking at states of matter. Now we've spent a lot of time looking at gases. So we're going to look briefly at gases in comparison to solids and liquids. But this chapter focuses primarily on the solid and liquid states. So when you have a solid, oh, and I want to encourage you also, like I've done for previous uh, quizzes, take a good look at the review material at the end of the chapter. There's some equations for this chapter. Make sure you know those. But there's a lot of definitions in this chapter that you'll need to know. So go through those, write those down, get a good idea what they are in case you face them on a quiz or an exam. You'll have a quick reference for those things. Um, so the solid state, when we think about solids, what we think about is molecules that are closely spaced together. And as you can see, they're moving here a little bit. Um, but really, the reason they don't move far apart from them is in the solid state, the intermolecular forces are strong relative to the thermal energy they possess. And so they tend to vibrate like this in place, held together, and have a definite shape. Now, on the liquid side, right, the molecules have a little bit more freedom to roam. In principle, what we find for most substances, as you go to the liquid state, they uh, expand a little bit. The only exception to this, really, that is very common is water, uh, and I'll show you that here in a second. But now, in order to get to this liquid state where the molecules are moving about, what you need to do is add energy to the system. So the liquid relative uh, uh, intermolecular force is moderate relative to the uh, thermal energy. And as a result, they're able to move and slide around each other. So molecules in a liquid aren't static like they are in a solid where they're sort of stuck in place. And then for gases, what we find is there's a lot of mobility uh, amongst the molecules of the gas or atoms of the gas. Again, you have to add energy so that they have enough kinetic energy to really overcome the intermolecular forces that are acting between the molecules of the substance. And so what we find is intermolecular forces are weak relative to the energy that's been put into it. Now, if you're talking about water, right, water is typically typically converted into steam at 100 degrees Celsius. At that point, it has a density, and I put this in, in, in terms of uh, un, um, scientific or notation similar to that of water and ice, but you can see how much less dense gas is, right, versus a liquid. And approximately speaking, it's 1,000 uh, to 2,000 times less dense than the liquid state. So that means if you think about what the volume of a gas is at 100 degrees, this is for water vapor, it's 30.6 liters of substance right, for one mole, whereas water, because it has a much higher density, is 18.0 milliliters. That's a direct result of the liquid molecules not having enough uh, energy to overcome the intermolecular forces that hold them together. Now, if you're looking at water in particular, one of the things you'll notice is it does what you expect it to do when you go from 20 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius. The density gets higher because the energy between the molecules gets lower. The lower energy causes them to move together and the density goes up. But there's a very interesting phenomenon that happens in water, is that is when you get it to zero degrees Celsius, in the crystalline state, and we'll talk about water's uh, solid state in some detail later, it actually becomes less dense because the crystal structure doesn't allow the molecules to be lined up in a random fashion. Now, in terms of properties of the different states, we can look at it in terms of... Um, their density, right? Low for gas, high for liquids and solids. These are both very similar to each other. Uh, shape is indefinite, but the volume for a liquid is definite because the molecules can't move apart from each other. They take a fixed volume. But for gas molecules, 
it's indefinite volume. That is, if you take a few molecules or a few milliliters of liquid and you allow it to evaporate into a room, let's say the size of your bedroom, um, it'll fill the whole room. But if you took that same liquid and you put it inside, let's say, a basketball auditorium, for example, and there was no other source of water, it would vaporize and fill that entire space as well. So gases tend to completely fill their containers, have an indefinite volume, just depending on the size of the container. A couple of other properties uh, that we talk about for liquids, uh, solids and gases is the compressibility. Now the compressibility is the ability to sort of squeeze the atoms to a smaller space. So if, if you if you have high compressibility you're able to squeeze the atoms together a lot and then if you're low compressibility then there's not much compressing that can be done. You can't squeeze it very much. So when you think about being able to compress a solid, since the atoms are already very close to each other, there's very little space in between. The same is actually true for liquids. There's a little bit of space, um, but there's not much. And so solids and liquids tend to be what we say incompressible. Again, these are, are terms that are reviewed in the first couple of sections of your book, so make sure you read through those. And gases tend to be very compressible. And you can see why when you think about the structure of a gas. In the gas, you have lots of space uh, and lots of distance that you can squeeze the atoms together. If you're looking at in terms of density, right, gas has very low density. So it can be compressed all the way to the point where it almost reaches the density of a liquid. And we'll talk about that as well later. Depending on the temperature, it can take on a new state of matter. So when we talk about the transition between the solid, liquid, and gas states, I like to draw the diagram with the solid at the bottom, liquid in the middle, and gas at the top. Going up is increasing in energy. That's to correspond with the solid going to the liquid requiring energy, Right, the liquid to the gas requires energy. And then if you want to go from gas to liquid, you have to remove energy. So these are opposite processes, but it visually makes more sense to me. You're increasing going up and decreasing going down. So I'm increasing energy as I go up, decreasing energy as I go down. For the solid to gas transition, this is one that we're not as familiar with familiar with. This is known as sublimation. This is what you see when you're talking about, for example, dry ice. CO2, solid, goes directly to CO2 gas. So when you go to the store and you buy dry ice for like a punch or, you know, the Halloween uh, punch bowl, for example, and you want it to bubble and froth. Well, typically, the way that's done is we're putting dry ice into the drink. And the reason we don't we use dry ice is because it creates the CO2 gas, which is the bubbles. But the, what people mostly don't realize is that when you're doing dry ice, it actually never goes through the liquid state. It transforms directly from the solid to the gas. You can also see this in your freezer. When you take a piece of food and you wrap it up and you stick it in the freezer, when you come back to it sometime later, it doesn't have to be that long either, and you open it up, you'll see ice crystals that are formed all over the food. And that's actually from the process of the water, ice actually, frozen water, um, subliming, going to the gas state, and then doing what's called deposition. Deposition is the reverse of the sublimation process. So this is an endothermic process. This would be an exothermic process. So when you think about the way the food, the ice crystals form on the food, so here's a piece of food underneath a wrapping. I don't know what uh, the food is or what the wrapping is. Um, what tends to happen is we have sublimation here, and then it deposits, or we get deposition up here, and that's where you find all the ice crystals. And that's because the outer part of the freezer, that's where the food is freezing into, where it's transferring its heat, is cooler outside here than in here when it starts. And so you'll see ice crystals deposited on the inside of the container that you've frozen it in. All right, so 
those were a little less familiar. Uh, the more familiar ones are solid to liquid, which we call uh, melting, and then liquid to gas, which we call vaporization. Gas to liquid is condensation, and liquid to solid is freezing. Now, one of the things about liquid to gas transformation is we often refer to something called the boiling point. And we'll define this more clearly later. But the boiling point is the temperature where the vapor pressure, okay, the vapor pressure of the liquid, and we've talked about this before in the gas laws chapter, where the vapor pressure of the liquid is one atmosphere. And it turns out that this temperature for this temperature is a constant value. So as you heat up water, for example, and we're normally in around one atmosphere pressure, that temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. And the reason you see the bubbles forming in the water is because the water's vapor is now at one atmosphere and it can actually compete with the atmospheric pressure, which is normally trying to keep the liquid tamped down into the liquid state. So you see bubbles forming. Those bubbles are actually H2O gas that are formed. Now, when you go the other way and you condense the liquid, it turns out at one atmosphere, the condensation temperature, the temperature at which it'll begin to condense, is also 100 degrees. So it turns out water and, and most uh, liquids and gas transitions happen at a constant temperature. The only difference is the fact that you're putting energy in to go to the gas state and you're taking energy out to go to the liquid state. So that's why when you open up, let's say, a pot of boiling water and the steam comes out, the steam is not the cloud. It's actually the invisible gas of the water vapor. When it hits your skin and condenses, it releases all that energy, and that's where the burn from uh, steam comes from. It's not from the mist that comes out. Right, the, like a fog almost that comes out of the pot. That's actually just liquid water droplets that are very small and spaced apart. It's called a colloid, actually. Um, but what, what burns you is the transition from the gas to the liquid state. And usually that's a fairly large transition in energy. So that's why you can get burned really bad from steam. On the other hand, liquids and solids, right, we have two transitions there, too. We have a melting and a freezing whether or not the melting point or the freezing point are the same, and has a similar definition to this, okay? Whether or not the melting point or the freezing point of the liquid and the solid is the same depends on what kind of material it is. We have two types of solids. There's both crystalline solids and amorphous solids. And sort of real briefly, right, a crystalline solid has a regular ordered structure. And we'll study this more detail in more detail later. Um, if you think about putting a dot at, at the corner of this, you can see this sort of trapezoidal shape, right? Um, you can put repeating dots like this, and you'll notice that these big dots have the similar shape to these, right? And if it has this regular ordered structure, we call it a long range structure. Then it's a crystalline solid. And this is an example, I took it from a Wikimedia uh, site, but this is sodium chloride actually. Uh, sodium chloride crystals, when they naturally form, they're called halite. And they have this cubic sort of shape, and that comes from the long-range structure of the crystalline solid. Crystalline solids will melt and freeze at the same temperature. Now, amorphous solids are ones that don't have this structure, so it's a little harder to sort of give a good definition of an amorphous solid. It's just no long-range order. A real common example of an amorphous solid would be butter. Again, Wikimedia stolen picture, I believe. Um, 
how do you know it's amorphous, right? The way you know it's amorphous is when you're heating it up, it gets soft rather than melts completely. So it continues to get soft over a range of temperatures. And sometimes the liquid will come off of it sooner. Sometimes it'll be a little later. But amorphous solids have poorly defined melting points. In fact, they usually define it as a melting point range when it starts to get soft and when it's completely liquefied. Now, when we're looking at, again, solids and liquids then, this behavior is true for both amorphous and crystalline solids, but whether or not it's a single temperature depends on whether or not it's crystalline, which is one temperature, or amorphous, which is usually a range of temperatures, not the constant temperature that we see for crystalline solids. Typically, in a crystalline solid that's pure, when you're melting it, the, the entire solid will melt over a range of temperatures of less than about one or two degrees uh, Celsius as you're trying to melt it. And it's a very good indica indicator of whether or not the substance is pure and also a very good indicator of what the substance is because melting points are one of those constants that we can use to identify different kinds of materials. So this is uh, pretty much straight out of your textbook. Um, there's a standing common misconception and I just think it's funny that Tro includes this, I include it, I've seen it so many places and st still people have trouble with this idea. So this is what liquid water looks like. When you boil water, right, what is the, what is the composition of the vapor look like? All right, so take a look at your choices, A, B, and C, and give it a second pause the video, come up with an answer, and when you restart it, we'll discuss it. All right, so we have water molecules, right? So we're going from H2O, the, rea oh, sorry. the reaction that we would use is H2O liquid going to H2O gas. This is the reaction we use to indicate the vaporization of water in the liquid state to water in the gas state. So what do you expect to find? Well, the vapor should look, ex the molecules should ex look exactly like H2O in the liquid state because they're the same substance. So A is the correct choice, but it's crazy if, you, if you've been doing this for a long time or how many people think that when you boil water, you're actually splitting the bonds up? And there's, there's not enough energy in the boiling of water to split the bonds. Some people think even it goes all the way down to the atoms. So if you were one of those people that thought that, don't feel bad. So many people think this. But the truth is, if you think about what the transition is, then you know what the answer should look like. It's that the in the gas state... The substance looks exactly like in the liquid state. It's just further spaced apart and has more kinetic energy.